In today's video, we're going to be diving into the Dispossessed, formerly known as the Dwarves of Warhammer Fantasy Battles. Welcome Wargamers, my name is Doug with 2 Plus Tough, and today we're covering one of the most beloved factions in the entire game, and I'm very excited to dig into this. Before I begin, I want to make sure that we all are on the same page. At the time of recording, this video is going to be very much like the Skaven and Moon Clan Grotz videos that I did, where there's very limited lore on this faction, but people have been pining for it, asking for it, and so I want to share what I know with you and just get you pumped for what might be coming in the future. For you folks who are new to the Age of Sigmar setting and not knowing why the Dispossessed have such a strong, kind of almost cult following, it is because in Warhammer Fantasy Battles, they were very much reminiscent of the dwarves from the kind of Tolkien-esque narratives like Lord of the Rings and things like that. Very stereotypical, classic fantasy dwarves, slightly Viking-ish, and they lived underground in these elaborate, beautifully carved, caved systems that spanned much of the old world. A lot of it had a cave system going through it. Their god was Grugni, who was the god of miners. And as a people, they treasured minerals and riches above all else. They were kind of known for being somewhat greedy, but this greed was used to advance their technology and also their society. They were a very technologically advanced race in terms of firearms, manned flight, those kinds of things. As far as why they fought, it was mostly to protect their lands. Uh, the more you learn about the history of the old world, it was uh, dwarves, or dwarden as we now call them, had kingdoms that expanded across multiple continents, and as the other factions kind of came to power, as the Dark Elves left Ulthuan and made a presence on the mainland, other factions started growing in power, mankind became a, a dominant race. They all started to chip away at the mega kingdom that was the Dispossessed. And so their stories often were defending holds, keeping their people safe with a firm grasp on their territories and their minerals. One of the most defining characteristics of this faction was honor. They were one of the most honorable races in the old world. By this I mean uh, they had something called the Book of Grudges, okay? This is one of the coolest models there was. And basically if you did something to tick them off, they would write your name down in the Book of Grudges. And it was up to the honor of every clan, fort, whatever you want to call them, to make good on that honor by meaning uh, if you wrote a name down in the book of grudges, you had a grudge against someone, your children's children's children are honor bound to try and seek out that enemy and make that right. They had a very strict code of conduct within the keeps and it was just functionally, internally, it was a very honorable society. They did a lot of great things for each other, a lot of progress, good things that we can see. This is one of those factions, it's very easy to see them fitting into an order army, unlike, say, Daughters of Cain or Edenith Deepkin. Now, I am giving you just the slightest bit of their history. If you go over to the Warhammer Fantasy Wikia, uh, it is the one of the largest histories of an old world faction. These guys have an immense amount of backstory and things like that in the old world. Uh, I know that I was first really introduced to their backstory through the Sundering series, which actually follows the Civil War with the Elven race, the High Elves and Dark Elves, things like that. And they introduced the uh, Dwarves back then really early on. And by the time the Elves found them, they were already this flourishing race with fortifications everywhere. Uh, it was a really great thing to see the factions intertwine with one another at such a young age in terms of the timeline was really a great story. So there's a lot there. If you want are interested in this faction whatsoever, you can spend hours reading over that page. Point is, for you new folks, the reason why people love these is these guys have an immensely detailed backstory that is full of color and all kinds of great little, little subplots and narratives. Uh, but just kind of the takeaways were uh, very classic dwarves according to kind of Tolkien-esque lore and very heavy emphasis on honor and grudges and defending territory and things like that. Now moving into the Age of Sigmar, where our current setting is, they've really developed uh, Grugni as a god, okay? He's one of two uh, dwarven gods, so it's a dwarden now gods, uh, the other being Grimnir. We covered Grimnir a little bit when we did the Fire Slayers. Uh, he's more of the hot-headed warrior aspect of the dwarden, whereas Grugni focuses on craftsmanship, metallurgy, and arcane technology. If you read the opening chapter of The Spear of Shadows by Josh Reynolds, they actually describe Grugni himself 
And it's like this blackened skin. His hair is made of fire. His beard is made of this like wisping smoke and soot that's coming off of his eternally burning kiln. He looks into the flames and sees the fates of men. All kinds of awesome, awesome descriptions. If you haven't read that book, I'm going through it right now. I definitely recommend reading it. Well, during the Age of Myth, Sigmar, as he was traveling the different realms and exploring, came upon Grugni and Grimnir. And there's not a lot of detail surrounding that. I'm hoping when the new edition book uh, for Second Ed, Age of Sigmar, drops, we'll get a little more detail on how he met them and what that story was like. But Sigmar took the two, consolidated his forces in the Realm of Light. And it was there that Grugni got to see just how many Dwarden survived the Old World. And it was crushing to see that so few of his children made it. In fact, it brought him to tears, and when he cried, it actually his tears were molten lava, and where they fell, legend tells, that this is where some of the greatest forges were made. Like, he cried out forges that the Dwarden then used to make weapons and technology and things like that. Now, even though he was sad to see so few of his people survived, Grugni was just honor-bound to himself. He said, thank you so much for reuniting me for the survivors of my people. Uh, he basically made an honor oath to Sigmar to help him in the future. Now again, you gotta remember, honor is a huge theme in this army. These are the guys who it's very easy to be like, yes, you are a good guy. And we learn later on that Grugni was actually instrumental in forging a material called Sigmarite, made from the old core of the old world, uh, and without his technological prowess and metallurgy and abilities, what we now know as the Stormcast Eternals wouldn't have never been possible. So to kind of put it in the context of the Pantheon, Sigmar really used Grugni as sort of a senior engineer when it came to making this new type of weapon to fight Chaos. And that's a really cool position that not a lot of other factions have, right? Like the Chaos side doesn't really have that kind of engineering type prowess, and that's very unique amongst Order. So that's what we know about Grugni right now, but let's talk about the dispossessed themselves, the actual Dwarden on foot, the survivors from the Old World. Well, they survived the Age of Chaos, uh, by retreating underground into mountains. It seems as though, this is kind of where the story picks up, but it seems as though uh, Sigmar rescued them. Times were flourishing during the Age of Myth. They were able to repopulate quite a bit. We know from the book Warstorm that they did inhabit the realm of, realm of metal quite a bit, which makes sense, looking for minerals and gold and things like that, uh, because Stormcast walked through the remnants of their societies when they were looking for them. But when the Age of Chaos came and everything went to heck, uh, they retreated into their mountain forts and really uh, kind of created these incredible clockwork mechanism fortresses that were almost impregnable. They're described as being made of hard lines and unyielding angles, something that like, it's just a tough nut to crack. In fact, uh, there was a fortification that Korn had uh, in one of the Rumgate War books, and I'm, I'm always blanking, I always get the last two confused. But uh, it was actually made by dwarves, or Dwarden, and then Korn took it over and then the fortification was so perfectly made that they just didn't change much. And the only weakness is that you can fly into it. Well, if these Dwarden are building these same types of fortresses into mountains where you can't fly into them, uh, they are all but impossible to take. And of course, when the Age of Sigmar began, Stormcast Eternals came down and started pushing back chaos. The holds that the uh, Dispossessed were hiding in unlocked for the first time. And then this is how we now know the army as rejoining the forces of order, coming out of hiding with vengeance and anger in their hearts. There's a lot of names of chaos leaders written in these books of grudges. They travel very closely with order armies. They are very eager to lend a hand. They want to push back chaos. They're very motivated, very angry and vengeful. And specifically, they are excelling at bringing down chaos bastions, big fortifications, things like that. Again, these guys are masters of defensive technology. So bringing down huge fortresses is probably just about as easy as collapsing huge pieces of cave and mountain. Point is, siege warfare is their thing. We're going to touch on that a little bit. What's of equal note, however, is that on the rubble of these destroyed Chaos Bastions, they are really, really quick to build new cities. Which is great, because not only do they function as weapons of war, but also pieces of creation. They bring their engineering expertise to order as an entire faction, or as a grand alliance. That's their contribution. They can tear down bad things and then incredibly quickly rebuild great things. And it's important to note that uh, they have not been unscathed by the forces of chaos, right? They didn't lock themselves up and were completely fine. They have an entire type of unit called the Unforged, which uh, I think uses the old Slayer model, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but these are Dwarden whose minds have been broken by chaos. By seeing the full capacity of chaos, 
uh, it literally broke them. And so rather than giving them an inglorious death, uh, basically the dispossessed keep these guys until the next fight comes and then let them basically go on a suicide mission, act as a wrecking ball that is unarmored and really is going to get killed, but it gives them a chance to avenge kind of their own brokenness in battle. Point is, I like the fact that they noted that Age of Chaos really did have a dramatic effect on them. So with all that out of the way, why are the Dispossessed an important faction in Age of Sigmar? Well, I think they fill a very unique role in that we, when we talk about the initial Age of Sigmar starting, right, when the Stormcast busts in, and then we had that Seasons of War campaign where uh, apparently like 200 years passed because then we had full cities like Hammerhall and all those things being forged that we were fighting over. Uh, we know that several hundred years have passed since the first book and then where we are now. Okay, that's a, just a fact. But we don't see kind of the flavor added in between those two things. That the dispossessed really would have shined in that time by being the people who were going to build those immense fortifications and cities and all those kind of impregnable fortresses and things like that. They're the faction that made that transition possible. And it's so exciting to think that we're going to get a battle to them at some point that represents a faction that not only destroys enemy civilizations and fortifications and things like that, but also builds them so quickly and efficiently for order. And think about this, how excited were people when Fire Slayers and Carriage and Overlords came out? I cannot tell you how stoked people were when Fire Slayers were announced because it was way early in Age of Sigmar releases and people were like, oh, dwarves, dwarden, right? This is something that I can relate to. I understand it from the old world. That's why I used the word dwarves there uh, because it was something tangible that people knew and they were very stoked about it. And equally so, they were somewhat disappointed when the books came out. There's not much lore on the dispossessed, those classic dwarden that they can relate to, that they have a good grip on. And so kind of this swing of excitement to disappointment lets you know that like, hey, people want this thing. They want the classic Dwarden that they know of, the ones who forge in mountains, who build amazing technological advancements, who make societies possible for the rest of the armies of order. And just like the Skaven, and just like the Moon Clan Grotz, these guys really are one of the most iconic armies in Warhammer Fantasy Battles and would love to see them get reborn in Age of Sigmar. Because they were a team that people really rooted for, right? People had fun playing as Dwarden, as dwarves in Warhammer Fantasy Battles. People would talk like dwarves. They'd grow big beards for being a dwarf player. They would insult their opponents like that, and people would be like, oh, I just hate you because you have a dwarf army, right? It was a fun banter thing that just encouraged a lot of immersion in the game. People loved this army. Not only that, but as mentioned before, they really honestly truly do have some of the deepest, longest running lore in the entire Warhammer Fantasy Battle range, okay? So I'm talking about the sheer number of books, characters, back histories, um, way they've influenced the history of the world, not necessarily as being key players, but like introducing guns to the humans, like that kind of stuff where it's like, okay, well now that's a, a branch of that tree that just went off and like humans became a dominant force for a little while. Those kinds of things are so influential in the timeline that people really associate progress and story-driven events with this faction. Not only that, but they have a massive, massive model range. And they kind of split it up a little bit with Age of Sigmar, but not as much as some other factions. The uh, big key pieces of artillery got moved to a kind of its own thing. Uh, but the key meat of being a Dwarden really stayed the same. They have a lot of different kinds of warriors. Some are heavily armored, some are lightly armored, and then leaders that really bring it all together. But it's not just one of these things that make them an iconic faction and so loved, it's all of them. And when you put them together, you get something that's really awesome. And not only that, because they are so focused on infantry, like, you have artillery and technology, yes, but those were largely in support of your big blocks of dwarves that were just angry and had a shield in one hand and a hammer in the other. And because of that, you could build some very um, high unit count armies, like lots of dudes on the table to fight and just kind of hold the line. And because of that, they almost kind of gain this reputation somewhat of being a good guy Skaven. Like the perfect counterpart to a Skaven army if you wanted to be a good guy. Because now you have a bunch of dudes, some strong, super uh, lore-based characters that you could get into the persona of. And it was just a lot of fun. You had large numbers, character for heroes, and a unique play style with different kinds of weapons and things like that. I'm very pumped if you can't take it in my voice, right? It's just a fun army and I want to see it on the table again. And so to kind of end this conversation about them, I want to talk about what I'd like to see in a battle tome. 
Well, with 2.0 coming up, we know uh, the factions that were in General's Handbook 2017 are going to kind of be reinvented with the new kind of second edition in mind, and I have no reason to think that these guys won't transition as well. We don't know how vastly different their rules are going to be. If you'd like to see what the uh, rules were for 2017, I have a link to a review that I did for them. They, I think, had really flavorful rules, and I thought they were a lot of fun. But the basic idea is a system where your army has a grudge, and you can change that grudge with certain things throughout the game, but basically a grudge gave you reroll ones to hit against blank, and blank might be units with 20 or more models because you were outnumbered and you're mad about being outnumbered, or units that had a four up save because you hated the guys who were beefier and tougher than you, those kinds of things. And so uh, add a lot of flavor to really double down on the honor thing of like, I hate being outnumbered because it shows that my enemy thinks they can just swarm all over us, right? It's a very characterful, get into it kind of thing, and whatever you hate, that's what you're really great at killing. It's awesome, it keeps the old world flavor, but transitions it into a game mechanic that works for Age of Sigmar. As far as a battle tome goes, things that we're likely to see is the different holds for Dispossessed getting different rules. So uh, maybe expanding that system to where certain holds really master certain kinds of warfare. And I'd love to see this defensive aspect brought into a game. We don't see a lot of armies that have defensive mechanics. Uh, certainly of note lately have been the Eidneth Deepkin with their whole, you know, turn one, everyone gets cover. Uh, third rat around, you get to dictate combat. You get to go first, basically. But what that means in terms of dispossessed might be, you know, cover saves are still a great idea, but maybe use of terrain, things like that, to simulate fortifications that are being built those kinds of things. I'd love it if they had their own terrain kits like the big boat or the Gnarlmoth or Maggotkin. Those kinds of terrain pieces that add flavor to the army that really lend themselves narratively to being, hey, these are the guys who build fortifications. And I don't want it to be like 40k where it's a bunch of, you know, uh, gun platforms and things like that necessarily, but something flavorful that adds a defensive measure to the army would be great. If they wanted to double down on the tunneling and mining aspect of the army, which they kind of got rid of the tunnelers, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, because they were a really old kit, uh, they could do a deployment mechanic. Deep can have this. They have a guy that says, hey, if you take this dude, take two units with him and set him up later. That kind of thing would be perfectly flavorful and, and keep to the lore of the army, I think, exceptionally well. And with a new addition coming, we don't really know how terrain's going to fit into that, but if terrain becomes a bigger deal, having things that affect terrain on the table to kind of simulate their way of tearing down enemy fortifications and things like that would be awesome. If you could deny cover bonuses to certain units, even if, you know, I don't, I don't know how it's going to work, but something to work with the table itself, I think is really going to be the key to these guys. Because that would both simulate kind of their way of tearing down enemy fortifications, and if they got bonuses to terrain and things like that, that would be immensely awesome for them. And those are really the things that I'm looking forward to. When I say Battle Tome, I'm talking more than the General's Handbook, that kind of stuff. Um, I want to see the terrain and the table become a instrument which they can use to their full effect. I'd love to see uh, models that represent fortifications and things like that, as well as the unique holds, and how each one of these things uh, survived the Age of Chaos and became a stronger fighting force because of it. So friends, those are my thoughts on the Dispossessed. I love the faction. They're one of the most iconic ones in Age of Sigmar, certainly in Warhammer Fantasy Battles, and I'd love to see them brought up into the new world. And I want to hear your thoughts. What would you like to see in a battle tome specifically for the Dispossessed? Why do you like the army? If you have them, man, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are about them. If you didn't catch it in my last video talking about how to be great in second edition, you should go check it out. There's a ton of discussion, way more comments than I expected. Uh, if you didn't hear the announcement there, I'm going to be moving into Corn Week. What I mean is I'm so excited for second edition, but there's a lot of great stories to be told now instead of just waiting for something new. So let's go ahead and tell those stories. We're going to jump into Corn Week and start it off with my favorite guy, Corgus Cole. I look forward to seeing you guys next week in our next Age of Sigmar lore video. Thank you guys so much for watching, and happy wargaming.